everybody. Thank you for joining us today to Innovation Nation. My name's Sarah, and today is a very special day because I get to have a conversation with a very good friend, somebody who I went to college with, Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. We also went to the same first company out of school. We also are from Southern California, and we have become really good friends throughout our time in the security market. So, Danny, can you please introduce yourself? Hey guys, uh, my name is Danny Schulman. Um, been in the industry for about eight eight years now. Uh, like Sarah said, you know, come from Cal Poly, studying industrial engineering, and somehow made my way into the uh, security industry. Like many of us, um, don't know how we ended up here, but somehow got got here, and now we're uh, enjoying the the kind of the up and coming technology that that we're experiencing. And so it's an exciting time to be in this industry, and really excited to be on this. Uh, you know, talking with Sarah here. Thank you, Danny. And I agree. Um, a lot of us don't know how we got here, but we did somehow. So couldn't have said that better. Um, sorry about that notification. So yeah, I'm excited today because I have a very interesting topic that I'd like to bring up. And I want to let you, we're going to start with you defining this. Um, I have obviously my own definitions of it, but I'm going to let you start. So Danny, could you please define SaaS for me? What is SaaS? What does it mean? What is, you know, what does it mean to a customer? Let's hear your perspective. Huh. So to me, SaaS is essentially, I mean, software as a service. So you're essentially, to me, it means that you're buying software and you're hosting it on a third party server. Mm -hmm. So you're not responsible for the maintenance, the management, the software updates of that actual software or system that you're purchasing. It's being managed remotely by a third party service. So instead of you paying for the resources yourself on site as an end user, you're actually buying it you know, someone else is managing it. So you're paying that difference. You're kind of moving the money from internally to paying someone, an outside company to actually maintain that software on your behalf or system on your behalf. So. Okay. Well said. What's, well your, said. what's your definition of it? Maybe mine's wrong, you know? No, I think you did it great. I that's you, you, you hit on the service point and, and service. And I, and I wanted, I wanted you to mention that for a reason. So I'm going to, I want to ask you a question because there's a really big, I think, misconception or misperception in this industry that, you know, if you have a system that is a SaaS system or SaaS based, right, the model of the actual, whether it's a product or a solution, whatever we're quote unquote providing, there's this misperception I keep running into people think that they're renting the equipment that might be associated with SaaS, right? And that's where we go into a hardware conversation in our physical security market and industry. We're not used to SaaS, right? SaaS is a very Silicon Valley software, you know, like, how do I describe it? It's just, it's not what we're used to seeing because we're physical security. We work with equipment and actual tangible solutions on a daily basis, right? Cameras, card readers, turnstiles, all these different things. So we're not used to seeing that associated directly with a service subscription, right? right? We're used to buying or selling or using, right? The owner uses whatever they're buying and they own it and keep it. Well, can you elaborate a little bit around like that misperception I'm talking about where people think that they're renting or that it's not theirs to keep when we're talking about hardware and SaaS combined? Yeah, That's I mean, right. it's mm -hmm. interesting because, you know, it is kind of like renting, but you're renting a... A server on someone else's, you know, like an Amazon Web Service or Microsoft Azure, right? They right. are kind of, you are kind of renting it, but it's it's it allows you as an end user to limit the amount of maintenance and service and you know having more predictable costs, right? If if you have a server that you're maintaining on site, whatever whatever the system, whether it's like turnstiles or cameras or access control, right? Any system, you're you're, there's going to be an unpredictable cost eventually where that server breaks down. You know, we all know servers last probably five, seven years, maybe, right? And I, there's a point where all of a sudden that server's done. And now that could be a 10, 20, $30,000 cost. That's just very unpredictable. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's preferable in, in my sense to not have to have those unpredictable costs because all of a sudden you're a small company and you know, you have a, you know, say a manufacturing plant with 30, 30 cameras or in 20 doors, uh, you know, that you're at, that are each on their own server. All of a sudden, you're budgeting every year for security upgrades or maintenance, right? All of a sudden, a server breaks. Now that's a twenty thousand dollars server you have to replace, and that that could be really hard on a small business to do that. Um, so I think like it is important, you know, it, 
it's important to ad adopt the, the cloud-based methodology in terms of how you're selling things because it's, it's a different mindset of how customers are adopting, I guess, the technology, if that makes sense. Um, okay, you just hit it. You hit it on the dot. You just said adopting the how to sell it and how customers are adopting it. <clears throat> That's spot on. So thank you. Because I am running into a challenge day, like very frequently now and as you know, I kind of, you know, I left JC, I went to a new company and, and, and I like to keep these conversations agnostic, right? We're talking about SaaS as a whole, SaaS is a concept. It doesn't matter what product it is. What matters is it's a model that exists. And it's something that is, if you can, do you agree it's somewhat newer maybe to our part of the market when it comes to solutions? I mean, we haven't, it isn't necessarily at the front lines from my perspective. I don't I, see. I used to work. Yeah, I mean, I used to work at a security integrator about three years ago, and okay. that security integrator did not sell any SaaS, literally none. Okay, wait. So it's really, I think, in the last four years, it's really been completely changing the industry as a whole, right? Right. Which integrator did you work for? I do want you didn't mention actually. I, rem I realized you didn't mention your background. Like, where did you work? Can you tell us the where you've worked before in the past? Sure. I was at Johnson Controls for five okay. years out of college. Uh, and then I went over to a company called the Vigilon, a uh, Motorola company, uh, doing on-premise servers and, and, and video surveillance systems and access control. And then moved over to Verkata, which is a cloud, you know, hybrid cloud-based uh, video and access control security solution. Um, okay. As well. So I've been kind of every, every type of, every point of the market, right? Integrator to, you know, yeah. on-premise uh, software and then also a uh, cloud software never worked for an end user yet that'll probably be the next path right um never know you know i mean that's actually i bring that up because it's extremely applicable to this conversation you have literally sat on every seat except for the end user side but you've sat on each seat of the table when it comes to the provider side right mm -hmm. and you've seen it and and i think it's very valuable hearing you say oh i've been with an integrator for five years so, so was I, right? I'm just a few years behind you. I'm kind of following your path, but two years behind. I mean, and, it, and it's interesting because I didn't have, I definitely had that experience of selling like on-prem solutions when I was with Johnson Controls too, as the integrator, but I haven't worked for a manufacturer that really did that. We, you know, my company now is, is kind of just went straight to what you're doing now. I kind of skipped over, right? I didn't, I didn't go to that in between because it really, from my perspective, isn't as prominent. It seems like as if that's kind of going away. Yeah, Maybe I mean, not. No, I mean, it, I think the industry needs more of it. And that's why you're seeing more and more companies adopting like this is like their main point of business, right? Like there's, there's probably like 10 access control companies in the last two years that have said we're access control in the cloud, right? It's in order to make it as a new company in this industry, I think you have to adopt the cloud model because it's very clear that the industry is going that, that direction. It's less management for end users. Um, they want, they, they're adopting managed services for all the other platforms, right? They're already, their point of sale system is cloud. Their HR software is cloud. Their CRMs are cloud, right? Really the last thing in their, in their, in their IT closet is probably an NVR. So it's only a matter of time before they're like, well, we don't want anything in our IT closet except for a POE switch. Um, ultimately this is going to allow end users to have like the lowest total cost of ownership because now they don't have to have someone on staff cleaning those, maintaining those, you know, managing software updates, unpredictable costs, like I mentioned, service calls, right? And I think it's important for end users, like the, the technologies are understanding that end users have a certain need now and it's not on-premise devices, right? And it's very well said. It's interesting also because you're talking about all these other platforms out there that, you know, this model has already been adopted. I mean, it's been around for a very long time from a, from a HR perspective, from payroll even, right? Like all these other systems out there have most likely been provided as a service, right? Software as a service. Yeah. And um, it's just a very interesting concept because when you think physical security, you know, as we evolve as an industry, we are hanging out with the IT folks more, right? We're hanging out with the people who are managing the back end, um, right? Or kind of managing what's housing us, right? What's enabling our systems to work. And if we don't adopt it, I, I, I feel as if we're going to, it's, it's going to be way, you know, the, how do I word this gracefully? We are going to be behind if we don't adopt it, if we don't speed up and make changes. Yeah. And even being from the integrator side, I see that in order to be the next, like 
you don't see many integrators around that were that were slow to adopt to IP, right? Mm -hmm. the companies that adopted IP first, like the Johnson Controls, are now one of the most you know premier integrators out there, right? Convergent, right? All these big companies is because they adopted IP, right? The next level after IP is now cloud. So right. you need to be as an integrator now looking at the integrator side, not the end user side. I think it's important for integrators to adopt cloud, the cloud you know, type of technology, because that's what customers are demanding and you need to be at the forefront or else you're going to be left in the dark and still selling you know, analog systems and IP systems. It's kind of like that transition. And this is the time right now where then tra that transition is happening. And ultimately, in my opinion, I think integrators will make more money from cloud-based systems because it allows them to have different type of revenue models and attract different types of customers too. So, I mean, it, I think the big things are reoccurring revenue um, and it's easier to install. Like how many, like Johnson Controls, we, we had, um, we would re uh, represent Genetech and Milestone, Exact Vision and, and Salient and all these random systems, right? And how hard is it for these technicians to be trained on all these different systems? When you have a cloud-based system, there's a lot of, it's a more of a simplistic type of architecture that mm -hmm. allows integrators to actually spend less time on installs and more time doing the things that are more important, like maybe service call or selling new systems, right? Um, you know, and so, and, and not only that, I think the hardest part of a system to set up is the server as well. So you're saving time on labor. It allows you to get maybe low bid in certain situations and it allows different types of customers that normally wouldn't consider security systems in general, or they're gonna buy, you know, Ring, for example. Why, why do you see so many end users with Ring out there? It's because it's a simplistic interface. Customers don't want these complex, you know, integrated systems. They want something that's simple because these end users don't want a, um, they're, not, they're not computer scientists or engineers, right? Using these systems. They're usually security guards or security officers that are running this, these, these investigations or, you know, and, and entering people into the badge holder system, right? And so the point is, is that we need to start selling systems that are more approachable for end users or else we're gonna be left in the dark as integrators um, unless we adopt these type of different systems. This is like music to my ears because I don't know if you realize it, but you also just did a really good job at explaining and kind of defining what we'd consider like a managed service provider, right? Like that's, the, you know, I see integrators are eventually, if they want to keep up, are probably going to have to make a big shift, right? Like it's time to become the managed service provider, the professional service team, right? Not the ones who are going out there and connecting wires and, and, integrating right at like a head end or like a back end, but are actually providing a true service to this customer and creating a relationship and growing that relationship, but then will lead to the reoccurring revenue, right? And that revenue stream in COVID-19, think about how having that recurring revenue is so important. It's predictable income. You're, you, and I hate to say it in these terms, but like you're locked in to that relationship obviously in a good way, right? Cause you're doing your job and you're taking care of your customer. But think of like this time right now, like people, if, if you're just pushing and selling products and getting on and off jobs and something like this happens to our world, how are you gonna, how do you stay alive, right? Construction's on hold or not all of it, but a good amount of it, right? The commodities are still there, but all the nice to haves aren't being considered right now, right? And when you have that, model and you can evolve and you can keep up with the technology, especially with it changing every two to three years. I feel like that's the true proper direction that we need to start seeing our industry go. Right. It, it's just better. It's better for everyone. Yeah. I, th I think, um, I mean, I, I have relations with a lot of uh, contractors and integrators and the ones that are doing well right now have adopted the cloud, you know, the cloud type of software as a service model, yeah. like two years ago because now they're relying on that reoccurring revenue to keep them afloat. So I think it's like really exactly. important. And, and for, for end users, like it allows you to capture different type of budgets because a lot of these SaaS companies, they'll say, all right, buy, buy one, year up, one year up front or sometimes buy five years up front. And so if you're, you're allowing yourself to capture certain customers that have maybe a capital one-time budget or a, an operational budget. So it, you can actually be more creative with how you're selling this. So I think uh, you know, having this software as a service is like, it's really necessary for integrators to adopt um, because it allows them to capture certain customers, like I mentioned, get the reoccurring. So when there is lulls in business um, and allow them to capture more customers because of potentially lower bids, because now they're, you know, the different type of budgeting, right? If they have a one year budget, one year's license, now they're, that upfront cost is going to be significantly less and the customer is okay with paying over time. Something we didn't mention though, Sarah, is the security of it all, right? Mm -hmm. I've, I mean, 
I remember a meeting I had when I Johnson Controls. This happened. They the end user had a a NVR stolen from their their uh, um, their IT room, right? Because every end user thinks they have the most amazing security, right? To prevention methods to be able to like my NVR is so secure. Well, let me tell you that, that employee. What is it like? Maybe eighty percent of the time, a theft inter- is in, is an internal employee. Internal they know theft. exactly how to access that IT room. They can. They know they have the floor plan of the building potentially. Um, it might be on the network. They have that, and they, they know exactly how to get into that building. So this 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 uh, incident, they actually came through the ceiling. They knew exactly where the IT room was. Came through the ceiling, tore off the NVR, broke it, and then had full range of that 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 a facility. Holy cow! And so security, not having to have your on on premise device, your ser- server on site allows you to actually be more secure. I'm gonna be honest, I trust Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure. I trust those guys that they're maintaining their security protocol way better than my internal staff if I had an IT staff on site. It's just reality, right? Like, you know, and maybe I'm wrong, but. They do what they do for a reason and they are so good at it because they know what they're doing. That is all they do. You think AWS, Azure, Google, all these colos. I mean, data centers is its own world in and of itself. It's a world in which a lot of us don't understand even, right? It's its own thing. I I think of it obviously as a critical environment, but when it comes to technology today, that is only going to continue to evolve. If you haven't noticed already, maybe we will, you know, I want to keep this in, you know, we have to end soon, but I think a good note to, to mention and just to think about is All the investment right now that is going on with data centers, I'm seeing an article almost every other day about a new data center getting built, whether it's Facebook, Google, Amazon, a lot in the East Coast, which is interesting. But my point is, is like, it's booming. It's COVID and a lot of businesses aren't. For some reason, those are. There's a reason. There's a reason. Recurring revenue. (laughs) Recurring revenue. And um, It, it, it... it, it all, it all layers in it's, it's, I mean, obviously SAS is different for a data center, but that model, that model that they've created is what is strong. Right. And okay. they figured it out. Yeah. Right. No, definitely. And, and, and I think, uh, kind of leave it on the, on this note and why I think it's so important to start adopting is that I, I mean, and I said it a little bit before, but I wanted to continue it is that we're now selling to normal people. We're not selling to engineers or computer scientists. Like these are normal people that we're selling to that are operating our systems, right? So in the past, they'd have a dedicated person that managed security, a dedicated person that managed IT. Right now, because of budget constraints and, and less staff, right now, there's, there's just normal people. Sometimes like I go into schools and the school administrator or the principal is managing their security system. Yes. So the softwares and the systems that we sell now have to be easy to use. The interfaces have to be easy and the whole architecture behind the system has to be easy to manage. So yeah. I think it's important that we start as integrators to start adopting that because those are our customers now. We have to create a simplistic approach to technologies that allow end users to adopt it and, and, and use the system and want to buy more of those systems, right? I like to say, this is how I like to describe it. I like to say, adopt it and then evolve with it, right? That's what I like to say. You can evolve with it. I think it's, it's just, it just makes so much sense. And I think um, it's a really good point for us to end on. I, I, you know, I really appreciate you joining me, Danny, and talking on this topic. There's so much more we can go into. Uh, I think I'm going to have to have you on soon again so we can start talking more hardware and SaaS combined at some point um, and how that looks. But I just want to thank you again so much for showing up today and and joining the conversation. Thanks, Sarah. It was a pleasure and um, I look forward to engaging with you in the future. Yeah. For all of you out there, if you want to meet Danny, um, I, I encourage you to add him on LinkedIn and give him a call or shoot him a note. He's one of the best people if you're bored and just want to have a conversation with. He's the best to talk to. He knows so much about this industry. He's been such a great coach and helpful, you know, mentor and friend for me as well. So for all of you out there, I definitely recommend you reaching out to him. So thank you so much. Bye guys.